One of the things that kind of defines the 21st century is this loss of faith in those mainstream institutions, political, medical, um, corporate, etc. And not without good reason, you know, you have corporate scandals, you have political scandals. But one consequence of that distrust is that anyone preaching that message of you can't trust those in power, that's going to resonate. I mean, people vote against their interests all the time in some way or another, right? We know that uh, many people would benefit from the expansion of social services and yet they vote against it. So there must be some other factors that really drive people's voting decisions and these factors might not be rational but they might be psychological. The classic attempt at dealing with conspiracy theories um, is to combat them with facts. Because of the way facts work, you need one of two things to get somebody to believe a fact. They either need to trust you. The other way you could go about it is by appealing to a shared authority. Hi. Can you hear me all right? I can, yes. I decided to sit down with Dr. Alexa Bankert to discuss her current research on development, measurement, and consequences of partisan identities in a two-party system. So, um, my name is Dr. Bankert, and um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Georgia. Um, we hope that Dr. Bankert could contextualize authoritarianism within the larger picture of American politics. And up until recently, political science assumed that um, people are rational actors and that we make uh, rational decisions based on very tangible benefits and it didn't take much evidence to falsify that. I think there are two um, that are really important. The first one is to think of partisanship, again, based on this rational choice idea, as something that is the product of our prior ideology and issue preferences, right? So you have a strong belief in abortion rights or you have a strong belief in the environment and so naturally you choose your party based on these issue preferences. We actually know from prior research that it is not quite how things work, especially in the US where you normally first learn what it means to be a Republican or a Democrat before you even have developed your own issue preferences and your own convictions. So think about like the Republican Party. Free trade was a cornerstone of what it meant to be a Republican. But we now see a shift even among Republicans toward more protectionist policies because the party has changed its stance on a particular issue. So the causal arrow flows the other way from our partisanship, our party loyalties, to our issue preferences. The second one is that we tend to think of partisanship as something that is positive so that we vote for a certain candidate because we really like the candidate or a candidate's party. But we actually know from data that most Americans feel at best lukewarm about their own party, right? So then the question is what drives their decision to vote in the first place? And that is where this new concept comes in called negative partisanship. So now our negative feelings, our disdain towards the opposing party is stronger than our attachments to our own party. So we're voting not for someone, we're voting against someone. The accusation of, of not being American or of being unpatriotic has always been common in the American discourse. So it's not new, it's not a new phenomenon. But I think what is new is that what we perceive as American is now based on our partisanship. So we accuse each other of being un unpatriotic or un-American as if, as if either party had a monopoly on what it means to be an American. We don't. And obviously, 2020 has been a year that's shaken our emotional, economic, and political state. But we wondered, how is America unique in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Levels of polarization. The US is one of the few countries where the pandemic actually has become partisan, right? So the best predictor of whether you think that the pandemic is serious and that you should be wearing a mask is now your partisanship. Um, even if you live in a state or in a county with a high number of correlated deaths, in the end, your partisanship is still the best predictor of whether you think this is a serious issue. And that is something utterly American. Right, like because in hardly any other country do we see this strong alignment um, between mask opposition and partisanship. And that is, of course, once again, because we are so polarized and we take our cues from our party leaders. 
So when our party leaders tell us that this is not serious, that this is all just a hoax, then we listen, right? Like we use party leaders as as a way to understand what's going on. And when you think about it, it makes sense because the pandemic is unprecedented, right? Like most of us have never gone through a pandemic. So we listen to the people, to the people we trust. And for many of us, that is the party leadership. But what happens when we can't trust our institutions? That question led me to Jeff Patterson, a PhD candidate at the University of Georgia, whose research focuses on counter-normative belief groups in order to understand how breakdowns in trust foster subcultural ideologies. So I study heterodoxy, which in basic terms is uh, beliefs and practices that fall outside of and in opposition to the mainstream. QAnon is a sort of grand unified conspiracy theory. It isn't any one conspiracy theory, but combining them in a way that presents a more or less coherent worldview. One of the most popular beliefs attached to QAnon is this belief in this anonymous person called Q that is uh, revealing information about Trump and his administration's fight against the so-called deep state. So there's a lot of different things you could look at. So there's this concept of schema consistency that we like to believe things that reinforce the worldview that we have. There's also the... Um, investigatory aspect of it that a lot of QAnon is um, these vague postings by Q that you then have to do the work yourself to put together. Um, so that helps people get involved and feel like they're invested in it. So the most concerning thing for me is that we don't really have a way of combating misinformation. You need one of two things to get somebody to believe a fact. They either need to trust you. Um, so O'Connor and Weatherall recently published a book, uh, Misinformation Agent, that talks about how that works, that you have a trust network that you derive your beliefs from um, because you don't have the time, resources, or knowledge to verify every single belief you have for yourself. You know, Most people believe the world is round because they've seen a globe, not because they've taken measurements. So there's one aspect of it. And so if you're not part of the trust network, you're going to have a very hard time convincing the facts. The other way you could go about it is by appealing to a shared authority, pointing them to science, pointing them to religion, if you have a shared religion. But because of how insular the social media world is and that echo chamber effect, it's unlikely that you're going to share an institution with them. You can't say, well, look at all these political scientists that have studied it and found it to be debunked because part of their belief system is that you can't trust those political scientists. And instead, what we're seeing is opposing camps spreading their own misinformation against each other. What Jeff Patterson said here reminded me of something that Dr. Bankert had said in our interview earlier. So we know from some work that conservatives uh, tend to react more strongly to fear-related messages. To a certain extent, that can probably be overridden by the messenger. So much more important than the message might in fact be the source of it. And so if this comes from a Democrat, let's say, then Republicans will you know, probably not listen and vice versa, right? So it has to be a, a trustworthy source from your own team to really change behaviors. Based on the data, I think what worries me the most is this um, weakening commitment to democratic values for the sake of winning. It seems to me like that many Americans no longer unconditionally uphold democratic norms and values. They do it only selectively, right? Whenever it benefits their political party, we have seen a trend of dehumanizing the other side. We think of them as evil and bad for the country and that level of, of dehumanization, uh, that lack of compassion and empathy for the other side, that's just detrimental, right? Like, I mean, I mean, then there is no point in even trying to bridge the gap or trying to reach out because the other side is no longer considered fully human. When I asked Dr. Banker and Jeff Patterson about solutions to the problems we discussed in our dividedness, our communication and our trust, their answers were largely the same. It's complicated, not hopeless. Lately, the things that connect us, our social ties and common humanity can seem like they're dissolving. Dr. Banker talked about dehumanization between political parties, and Jeff Patterson talked about how people are rightfully skeptical of institutions. So we can tell that there's a breakdown of trust, but also nuance and empathy in our communities. There's not one clean solution that's going to fix our society, but we have the tools to diagnose some of those root causes. And the tools are developed through education and science, to which Dr. Bankert says it best. Empirically verified research 
should inform politics and not the other way around.